and we are let me just double check once that stream starts we'll get rolling here okay yes we are here with you live on facebook and the juice guru community hello i'm steve prusak and i've got john vroman hey john where are you hanging out with us today uh, this is my home office in austin texas oh you're in austin i thought you were in pennsylvania for some reason you i was at one point yep Right when I read the book, <laughs> it, you were, uh, I think you're in Pennsylvania when you wrote this, right? Yeah, South Jersey was home for quite some time. Uh, a corporate position took me there. I met my wife and then we, uh, we kind of hung out in that area until we figured out that we could move anywhere and Austin was at the top of the list. Well, John is doing incredible work. His book is The Front Row Factor. We're going to do an interview with John, hear all about the work, what it means to live life in the front row and those kinds of experiences and and also about his uh, charity um, of giving people with terminal illnesses and, and life debilitating diseases front row opportunities. It's pretty amazing, John. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so good so, to be here, man. Thanks for having me. So and what's up, Facebook and wherever else this is being listened to? <laughs> yeah, if you're on Facebook, we will take questions uh, at the end. So you'll be able to type them in below. And if you're in the community with us, just type them in the chat box and we'll be taking them at the end. Again, the book is The Front Row Factor. You're going to want to pick up a copy. Um, I actually, I was a fan of the book and that's how I got John on the show. So I think you guys are really going to love this. So let's get, we're going to get rolling with this interview. Let's do it, man. I'm ready. Okay. This episode of Juice Guru Radio is brought to you by Try Best, making healthy living easy. Well, hello, I'm Steve Prusak, and welcome to another edition of Juice Guru Radio. And on today's show, we've got John Vroman. He's the author of The Front Row Factor and uh, founder of The Front Row Foundation, a charity established back in 2005 that creates unforgettable moments for individuals who are braving life-threatening illnesses. You want to hear all about it. So sit back, relax, have a juice, some tea, some water. We'll be back right after this with John Vroman. Hello and welcome back. Welcome back to Juice Crew Radio. I'm your host, Steve Prusak. We've got John Vroman here. I love his book, The Front Row Factor, available at bookstores worldwide, Amazon, the usual culprits. Uh, he's an award-winning keynote speaker, podcast host, and uh, uh, this book is a number one bestseller. It's, again, it's called The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. We're going to hear about that and his Front Row Foundation, a charity established in 2005, that creates unforgettable moments for people who are braving life-threatening illnesses. It's, it's intense. His website is frontrowfactor.com. We'll have a link to that up at Juice Guru Radio. Let's welcome to the show right now, John Vroman. What's up? <laughs> John, so as you can tell, I'm very excited to have you, and the work you're doing is so inspiring. So thank you for being here. Oh, this is great. I'm, uh, I appreciate these moments. So thank you. Let's talk about moments and how you came to the moment of writing this book and starting the charity and all the fantastic work you're doing. And then we can dive into some of the stories. I, I love it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Tell me how, where should I begin? What do you want to know? know? I, I just want, I want the complete download. Now let's go back <laughs> to how, how you got into this and, um, you know, helping people Let, let's define a front row experience too, for those that are, uh, you know, new to this idea. I know I, I'm kind of like jumping ahead because I've read the book. Um, let's talk about a front row experience, what that means, these kinds of moments. Mm, yeah. Well, this is my favorite thing to talk about. So, and, and being a professional speaker, it's a dangerous space to give me so much runway here. <laughs> um, so oh, let me start with, uh, let me start with where it all began. And by the way, speaking of moment making, you probably just saw my wife brought in a cup of hot tea and uh, yeah, so she was a moment maker now. Um, I, I, this whole thing began, Steve, going back to 2003-ish when I, when I started being challenged by some of my mentors to view contribution as one of the pillars of a successful life. And so it really got me thinking about how I was contributing to the world and uh, what what would ideal look like when it came to making a difference, which I think inherently so many of us want to do in our own unique ways. And so this was a question that had been posed and, and seeded and was really working its way around in my head and my heart of how would I give to the world? What were my talents? What, what was I supposed to do that was unique? And then what happened was I went to a Jason Mraz concert and you know the story, but I'll tell your audience because if you read the book, you know this. 
but I went to a Jason Mraz concert. It was on my birthday um, with my girlfriend and I was back row and I was looking, it was a smaller venue, but I looked down to the front and I could see clearly that this group of ladies was having the time of their life. And they looked like they wanted to be nowhere else other than right there. They were singing and dancing. They were present. They were engaged. They were part of the show. And then I looked around in the back row and I saw people kind of checked out. And I noticed that those people looked like they wanted to be anywhere other than there. They just weren't engaged. They weren't part of the show. And I said, you know, you could be having the same moment and have a different experience. You could be in the same spot, listening to the same music, the same artist, the same day, and two people having a drastically different experience. And that's kind of how life works, right? Like we don't always control where we are or, or what's happening. I always say you don't always choose your seat in life as that day I was given a back row seat, but you can choose whether or not you want to have a front row type experience. It's how you show up. And I walked away from that event feeling like there were parts of my life where I was in the back row. I was kind of watching things from afar, safely, you know, from a distance and not stepping up where I knew I could. So then what happened was a couple of weeks after that, my buddy challenged me to run a 52 mile ultra marathon. And I had never run a 5k. I had never run a 10k. I had never run a half marathon or a full marathon let alone a double marathon. But, you know, I was in the season of just saying yes. And so I said yes to this marathon and I started training and I was challenging myself at the highest level. And I was feeling fatigued, felt like I needed something else to motivate me, to pull me through. So we started looking at, well, what if we raise money for a charity? And I'll never forget this one day on an eight mile training run, my buddy Jamie and I were talking about what charity would we give to? Could we raise money for? And then the question turned to, well, what if we started a charity? What would that look like? What problem would we want to solve in the world? Or what do we love and what do we fear? There's a lot of power for your audience right now. I want you to consider this. What do you love and what do you fear? There's a lot of power there for the things that pull you forward and the things you're moving away from in life. So we started thinking about that on this run. I said, you know what I love are these moments in life where we get to create these epic experiences and then ta talk about the stories for years to come. And what I fear most in life is getting to the end and not having lived all my moments to the fullest. And so I said, well, what if we help people who are fighting for their life to have the best day of their life and then create a community that helps them live every day in the front row? And when I finally said it out loud, I was like, that's it, Front Row Foundation. And that day was the turning point. And since then, and fast forward all the way to this day, holding up the book that you were just there, was we finally, after a decade of doing this and creating more than a hundred of these experiences for people fighting for their lives, what we realized was that there's a lot you can learn about life from people fighting for it. And that people who recognize their impermanence and their mortality at a deep level, understand how that can lead to more vitality and prioritization and understanding how valuable these moments are. Like as an example, this podcast means so much to me because you are choosing to invest minutes with me and I'm in choosing to invest minutes with you. And these are minutes that neither of us ever get back. This is a part of our life. We're forever intertwined. These moments are now a part of our history and our story those moments are never to be taken for granted. And what I've realized is that, you know, if you want to live a great life, no matter how many years you have, uh, you have to put together some great years and great years are great months. Months are great, you know, uh, days, days are hours, hours are minutes and minutes are moments. So we lead, we lead our lives. We live our lives. We tell the stories of our lives one moment at a time. And I've just been privileged enough over the last decade to work with people who understand at a deep level the importance of life. And I could tell you story after story, and you've read some of them of what we've learned from these recipients, and maybe we'll get into that during the show. But that's really what this whole thing is about. It's, a, it's about cultivating a community of people who are moment makers. And what that means is making the most of the opportunities that you have, whether they're favorable or not. So no matter what you see you get in life, you can always choose to have a front row moment in life. And that's what we want to help people do, maximize their moments. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, we're listening to jo- John Vroman right here on G Screw Radio, the author of The Front Row Factor, Transform Your Life with the Art of Moment Making. And John, yeah, it's like, so part of it is the experience, but also part of it is teaching the importance of every moment. Because a lot of people just kind of waste the moments, don't they, with social media or whatever, just the never-ending distractions in life. I think that we all have the possibility, we have the potential to become numb to our moments, to, you know, there's great research on how we get into habits, which by the way, uh, can be very productive if they're the right type of habits, but yet there's a part of our brain that shuts off. If you've read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, he talks about that in lab rats that they would watch a part of the brain shut off and just kind of run through the motions of the, the maze. And we do that, right? We, we get into our routines and our habits and we, we forget to be moment makers and uh, we just move through the moments. But we, if we can learn to become more intentional and more aware and more present and more courageous and more connected in our moments, then we enrich our lives and we then lead by example and show other people how to do the same. So oftentimes it is about taking a step back and learning how to maximize our time. Like as an example, in the book, you, you know that we write about the three forces that we learned uh, in hindsight. We didn't see these in the beginning. I wish I could tell you that this was all like intentional from the start. But looking back, we said, why does this work so well? Why, why are people so moved and touched by these events? Because you could argue, well, it's just sending somebody to the front row of an event. Like how, how life-changing could that be? And here's what we recognized. Number one was the power of hope. We recognized that when we told somebody about an event, that hope brought power to the present moment for them. Hope wasn't about just envisioning the future. It was about how it changed our moments now. And Thomas K, a story that I tell often, uh, Thomas was a young man living in Canada, fighting for his life. And prior, he was an avid rugby player the picture of health. And very quickly, um, his health faded and he was in a wheelchair fighting for his life, body weight, you know, down, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, big time. And, you know, his eyesight was fading and he was literally going through treatment after treatment. Doctors were trying to figure out what was wrong. Well, he wanted to go see the rugby world cup in New Zealand and We were fired up about making this happen. So we raised the money and told him that he and his family were going to go to the rugby world cup. And what we heard from his family was that the minute we told him he was going, he changed uh, his approach towards his physical therapy. He started working harder because he wanted to stand for the national anthem. And see, knowing that we have a dream, knowing that we have hope, changes what we do about it now. And that's why I always say that hope is different than wishful thinking. Wishful thinking says, I wish things were different. But hope says, I have the power to make the difference. And so we recognize that force at work. The minute that a front row event took place, or that was announced, the impact had already begun. And the other thing that we recognize was the power of celebration and looking back. So many times we talk about not looking back in life, not living in a rear view mirror syndrome, right? Of looking back. But we, we fail to sometimes take into account that part of that is looking back on what worked, what was successful, what were our great moments in life. We learned about that from a a young man named Mike, who was 16 years old, but developmentally only that of about a nine-year-old. And we, Mike was fighting for his life. He had a, he had a bunch of things that were going wrong with his health. And so we quickly went into action and sent Mike and his family to go see uh, an event in Myrtle beach. He was a pirate fan. And so we sent him and his family down there and, um, you know, he was the first time he was on an airplane. It was the first time he was in a hotel. It was the first time he saw the ocean and it was an amazing experience. We videotaped and, and you know took pictures and all that's, by the way, on our site. But I will tell you that the real power of this event for me, I'd heard at the end was Mike was uh, back from the event and it was in his hospital be- uh, room because his, he was re- not doing well. And one of our staff members went to visit him and said, John, when I walked in, I saw Mike hooked up to all these tubes. And Mike was really in a bad spot, but he had a smile on his face because he was sitting there and he was flipping through the photo album. And uh, he, was, he was reminiscing about those moments. And I think for all of your listeners today, Steve, that what I would suggest is that you look back on your life and you could draw power from the great moments in your life. 
is sometimes we're so obsessed with the next thing on our to-do list that we forget to look at our pictures and our videos and our history and our story and think about the, the, the tough times we've been through and what we learned from that and the great moments we've had and how they shaped us and how grateful we can be for them. One of the practices of living a front row life is to get to the end of each day and look back and celebrate your front row moments. At dinner with my kids, we always do your failure and your front row moment. So where did you fail today and what did you learn from it? And what was your front row moment, which is really your highlight. And what that brings us to is this idea that we can all just learn to live in the moment, to live here and now. So the future is about bringing the future into the moment. The past is that celebration is about bringing the past into the present moment. And every piece of it is about learning how to maximize now. We use all these different tools. We can be completely present with somebody listening without any type of desire to respond, just to, just to be listening and to be heard. We can uh, notice the sunset. We can feel the breeze on our skin. We can be at that concert and hearing a song that the band has played a million times, but we've, we've, we only hear it this way, this one time. It's just like that old quote that says, you know, no man has ever stepped into the same river twice because it's never the same river and nor is it the same man. And so the same thing with every moment that we experience, you know, it's, they're always changing, they're always evolving. And we have to also remember that sometimes when we're in this space, you and I, and, and everybody listening in this personal and professional growth space, and we're, we're trying to maximize our lives and help others to do the same, that one of the things we have to remember is that personal growth or fulfillment isn't always about learning something new or experiencing something new. It's about remembering something true and I think that's, that's the case for all of us. Let me say that again, because uh, that, that's, that's that, great. What, that personal growth and professional growth isn't always about learning something new. It's about remembering something true. And so being a moment maker isn't always about epic experiences or front row at Coldplay in Europe. It's, it's also about being able to just experience the best of every moment you know, witness the best of every moment. Front row moment is watching your kids play. A front row moment is you and I on the show right now. Um, you know, that's, there's lots of ways to view our moments in life. And the better that we can get at making them attainable and uh, appreciating them, the more successful lives that we'll live. So we should define the process for those, you know, new to this idea. And basically it's, with the organization, it's, it reminds me of make a wish foundation in a way because you're granting a wish, uh, but it's completely different. So do you want to explain what the, exactly it is that you're doing for people and, and, and how you're tying that to their passions? Yeah. So what well, we always say, it's like make a wish meets Tony Robbins. And, you know, a lot of wish granting organizations are very clear that the mission is to grant a wish. And that, by the way, is amazing, right? Like, I love make a wish. We love all the dream and wish granting organizations that exist. One of the things that we, we all try to do is we try to bring our unique talents and passions to the table. It's like that Venn diagram when you say, hey, what are you exceptionally good at doing and what do you love to do and what would make the biggest difference in the world and where do those intersect? And for us, we had, I had been in the personal and professional growth space for so long that I thought, well, if we're going to do these events, what else could we do afterwards to where we could help people, not only the recipients, but their families and our donors and our volunteers and everybody to live an epic front row life. So we would not only create these events, but we would then create a community. We call it the front row family. And we would share all the wisdom that we were learning from other people that we were maybe creating ourselves. And I say maybe because we, I don't know what's original to me. I don't know if I heard that from somebody 10 years ago and I'm just repeating it sub, from my subconscious mind. But we're always trying to weave together our own new life strategy and share it with everybody that we're, we're working with. So yeah, we, that's who we are. We're, we're, we help kids and adults who have a life-threatening illness to see the event of their dreams from the front row. And then we use that as a launching pad to help everybody connected to our community to live every day uh, you know, in the front row, as we say, or to be moment makers. And so we launched a podcast, The Front Row Factor. We wrote the book to help people. We, we created a live events. We have a summit in Ohio every summer where we bring in people. Um, we partnered up with my, one of my best friends, Hal Elrod, who wrote The Miracle Morning. And uh, he has a live event in San Diego. In fact, as we record this in about two weeks from now called Best Year Ever Blueprint. And we brought Front Row Foundation and his event together. And so it's like, 
the idea of growing yourself and giving to others all under the same roof. And it's really amazing. So it's been a journey and it's been um, an incredible way for us to, as friends, you know, I always said this while you're building with friends, been a great way for our friends to do something quality together. You know, some people get together and go to the islands and sit on a beach. And I think that's wonderful. Our friends, uh, we tend to more often get together and do personal growth conferences and, and, and whatnot. You know, we would do that. And it's just spun off into a bunch of different things. Now we run front row dads. So we have entrepreneurial dads who get together twice a year for retreats. And, you know, it's just been a lot of fun. I run speaker trainings, um, you know, where I teach people how to give speeches. And it's just this idea of being in a space where we say, how can we all be creators? How can we all be givers? How can we show up, bring our talents to the table and make the most of the time we have? And can I, I'll show you, we'll share with you one more thing, Steve, which I think is really relevant to everybody is that why does this all matter, right? Why should anybody be listening to this? Why is this so important? And here's one of the things I want to share. I alluded to this a moment ago, but I want to talk about it for a moment. And that is, you know, I did this exercise a couple years ago that blew my mind. It got me totally focused on making the most of my days. And that was, I pulled out a journal. I was on an airplane. I pulled out a journal. I drew on the left-hand side a dot. And it said birth. And then I just wrote across on the other side of the page, another dot said death. Oh, I have no idea how, how long I'll be alive. I always say each day is a gift to all of us. We, we didn't do anything to earn or deserve this day. It was a gift. Yeah, listen, you might wear your seatbelt or eat healthy or do all those things. But the point is when your time is your time, you know, it's, it's beyond your control and, you know, in total. And so I said, you know, where am I? Let's say ideally, all right, let's say I live to be 100 right? Maybe it's longer, maybe, you know, whatever, but let's say I live to be a hundred and let's say 80 of those are really good years, right? Really good years where, you know, maybe after 80, I, I can't do some of the things I could do prior. And there I was as probably like a late thirties guy sitting there staring at this paper. And I saw my life half over, you know, if you will. And I saw it right there. And I was just like, wow, this is a call to action knowing that my days are, you know, that I have a finite number of days made me so excited. It wasn't, it made me sad. It didn't make me depressed. It made me appreciate the moments that I have. Um, as I record this, two days ago, one of my friends um, passed away from cancer, two days ago. And he was 38 years old and an amazing guy. Uh, I think about Hal Elrod, who I just mentioned, uh, one year ago, almost to the day, was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia and almost died, literally within a week, almost died, barely pulled through, and now is healthy, by the way, I should mention. But I think about how precious life is, and I think about how, for all of us, that we don't know how much time we have, and that that should inspire us to make the most of these moments. And so all we're trying to do is remind ourselves of that. And that's a practice. It's like anything else where if you're not, you know, eating healthy or exercising uh, every day, it starts to catch up with you. We need to practicing being a moment maker is the same thing. It's an awareness that our moments are real. And, and there's a guy, I don't know who to credit for this, but I heard about him. He had a bowl of marbles and he counted out. If he said, if I live to be a hundred, I have about this many weekends left, this many Saturdays in my life. And every, and he had a bowl of marbles for how many Saturdays he had. And every Saturday he'd move a marble over to the bowl the, the, that, Hey, this one's gone. This one's gone. And it was that physical act of moving the marble that helped him to remain conscious to the fact that these days were, were, were numbered for us in our life. And, um, you know, Hey, depending on your religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, maybe this is just the beginning um, maybe that the, there is no death and that you just uh, come back as another version of yourself. But in this life and in this body, this physical body, we have time. And it's important to know that and be inspired to do the most that we can with what we've got. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure working with all these people with terminal illness and granting the wishes, I'm sure that really, um, you know, deepened your awareness of how important every moment really is. So important. Yeah. Yeah. So what's next for the foundation? So you've got this event coming up. Um, it's amazing all the different things that are happening as a result of the work you're doing and, and how many people you're helping. How many people is it now that have, that have uh, had the experience? Uh, I think we're, do, we're, we're right now creating number 105. 
So let's talk about where you're going with it, your plans for the future goals and more dreams that you have to continue helping manifesting. And it really is giving back. It's really altruistic. It's like that top level of Maslow's, um, you know, right. when he talked about self-actualization and, and at, at a young age, you really um, started to give back more than, I mean, when I was a lot younger, I definitely wasn't where you were to, to really want to just make a life of it. I think that's really astounding. So what are your plans for the future with all this? Plans for the future would be keep doing what we're doing and just do it better. Um, keep evolving, keep innovating. I feel like I'm terrible at predicting the future. I feel like I, there's some things I hope will exist in the future, but I, I try to remain very open to whatever comes my way and being able to pivot. I just feel like mm. no matter what I do, I'll likely be serving people through the charity, through Front Row Foundation in one way, shape or form. But I actually hope it's very different than I envision right now. I hope that as I evolve as a human being, that my vision changes or that our collective vision co-creates the charity. And because I also don't know who will be part of our community one year from today or five years from today, I can't possibly predict where it will all be. And I love that. I love that uncertainty. But I'm more concerned with the be goals, how I want to be in every moment, how I want to be as the leader of the front row family. I, I, I consider that to be the big goal. So who I hope to be in the future is I hope to be somebody that remains a giver, that remains conscious enough to be aware of my own um, flaws as a human being, uh, of that I can be selfish as a person, that I can fall off the wagon, you know, from time to time. And that my, you know, that, that if I can remain aware and I can remain present and I can remain intentional to remember what people who are on their deathbed teach you. And that is, you know, very few people will say, I wish I would have worked and earned more money. I wish I would have won more awards. I, I wish I would have been more popular with, with everybody, or you don't hear those things. You know, you talk to, you know, as a father mm -hmm. of two boys, an eight-year-old and a three-year-old, I'm always asking, and because uh, I, I lead the front row dads, and I'm always asking, what advice do you have for younger dads? And they're always like, enjoy it. Like, enjoy it. It's, it goes by so fast, you'll blink and it feels like it's over. That's their advice. That's the big advice. It's, and that's the advice from people that don't have a lot of money, that have a lot of money, that it just doesn't matter who it is. Rarely do I ever hear, hey, make sure to work really, really hard to make more money because I wish I would have like given my kids more money or more, like it never, yeah, I never hear that. I never, right? like it just, it's, but yet some part of us, we feel that that's the thing we need to do. We need to be proving ourselves all the time or, uh, you know, being worthy of love and acknowledgement and worthy of other people's time and attention. And trust me, I get it. I get, I get wrapped up in that at times. Um, and I have to remind myself that at the end, when I am on my deathbed and I look back, what really matters? So what I hope to be in the future is what I, why I'm doing this is I want to try to remain part of the collective consciousness that's present to my life. And that's what our goal is, to create a community that remains there, that as we scale and as we raise more money and as we impact more people, that we don't lose our heart, that we don't lose our core, that we don't lose what brought us to this very moment today. And that it isn't always about bragging how big our charity got or how much money we raised or how many people we helped, but the way in which we helped them, the way in which we showed up every day, the way in which we served people. I'll never forget when I was building my business, you hear a lot in our space about platform. How big is your platform? How many downloads does your podcast get? How many pe people have read your book? And hey, the, the quality of your life is based on how many people you impact. And I've got to call BS on that a little bit because for me, right? Like, I'm like, I don't think the quality of your life is based on how many people you impact. I think it's based on the people that you're able to impact and, and, and how you're able to impact them. I don't think you're any more valuable if you've impacted a thousand to somebody that's in, in, in impacted 10, you know, it's like, because you can't play the ripple out enough. Like people, we want to idolize like a Bill Gates because of how much money he made and then how big of a charity he created. And, and you know, people could say about me, they're like, well, John, you're just jealous. This is a, the reason you're saying all this is because you're not Bill Gates. And if you were, you'd have a different tone. 
But let me just tell you how I feel. And that is that we just, we, we, we put them on a pedestal and we forget that like, what about the person who answered the suicide hotline last night, making $12 an hour, who is not rich, who doesn't have a huge platform, but they listened to somebody. They talked somebody off the ledge. They saved a life last night. And let's imagine for a moment that the person's life that they saved is the person who will find the cure for cancer. Now, if we play that out, who's more valuable, Bill Gates or, or the guy that you know worked at the suicide hotline and saved someone's life? And we don't know the ripple and the impact that we have. So, man, when you talk about future, Steve, what I hope to be is a good guy doing good things for people. And I hope that we just continue to evolve and to innovate and to serve in a way that when I'm done, that I'm proud. And that when I'm, when, you know, the reason I wrote that book, the primary reason that I wrote the book that you're holding is because when my kids, yep, when my kids read that book, I want them to know their dad. You know, I want my kids to know who their dad was. I wanted to, you know, pass along any information because I love the saying, if not for you, then who, right? If not for juice guru, who, like who's supposed to do it, right? You are, I am like, we're supposed to do it. It's not anybody else's responsibility. So man, what the, the future for us showing up, we always say show up, step up, speak up, right? Show up, rise up, give it up. Like the idea is to jump in and the metaphor of being in the front row and the vision that we're trying to come bring to light is that of service. We hear a lot of examples in life about like, get on the field, play the game. Don't be in the sidelines. I totally get it. I want to play the game. I want to be on stage. I'm a keynote speaker. I love being on stage, but I've got to tell you that we underestimate the value of showing up for people. We, we present like the sidelines are not where you want to be in life. And I say, Look, you can't tell me that showing up for somebody, right, cheering them on doesn't have as much value as the star player. The best and the best fans get the best show. You want to have great energy from your band, from your team, whatever, show up and cheer. And sometimes you're in the front row cheering on other people and sometimes you're on stage. But we've got to understand the value of being in the front row for people. So like as an example, here's, you, you know, Every audience needs an action, right? They need something. Give me something tangible, John, that not just life philosophy, but give me something I could do. Well, here's something you could do. In the book, I write about your top eight. I call that who's in your front row. But one of the things that's most important is I got to know who are my eight most important relationships, who's in my front row, and also how am I showing up for them? So whose front row am I in? And I've got to ask myself, my eight most important relationships. So this is your mission, everybody. Write down your eight most important relationships in life meaning total, every single person on the planet, who are the eight, and list them in order of importance. Every single person should do this. Every single person should know. And the point is they might go, oh, I can't do that, John. That's impossible. How do you list? How do you prioritize? I have three children. How do I make one more important than the other, right? And the point is you go like this. You go, look, you are prioritizing. You are making a decision. And if I have to put my two kids in priority order, I love them the same. It's not about love, but it's about my oldest son coming first because if I can lead my oldest son, he can lead my younger son. There is always a priority order, right? And we have to know who they are and we have to serve them and we have to know what their dreams are. So then I ask people, you list out your, your top eight. Can you tell me their number one dream or goal? Because we're all supposed to be wish granters. We're all supposed to be dream makers. We're all supposed to be moment makers. So, but the best way to do that, know your top eight and go help them to make their moments come true. Their dreams, their wishes, their like, look, there's a bunch of people listening to this right now that are married and they could not tell me right now. I know this for a fact because I do enough surveying. They could not tell me what their spouse's number one dream or goal is right now. There's enough people listening to this right now that could not tell me their parents' number one dream or goal. There's enough people out there listening that could not tell me their children's number one dream or goal. They think they know, but most of the time we're off because we haven't taken a moment to ask that question. So everybody's invited to be a moment maker. And the dream, the hope, Steve, the, the big future, 
we create a world of people who show up for others, who are moment makers for others, who lift people up, who put them in the front row you know, of their, uh, of their events, who give them the best performance or cheer for them, however you want to look at that. And ultimately, if we support all of our inner circle living out their biggest dreams and everybody's doing that, that to me is a, is a, is a world I want to live in. So now you've got, this is beautiful, and you've got lots of different ways that we can get involved in your community. I know as a, um, a front row dad, I'd like to be in there. How do we get involved in some of the things you guys are doing? I think the bet, this is the, this is the question, right? People are, how do I get involved? I think the step one is you've got to join the conversation. And this doesn't just go from my community. It goes to every community. If you want to get involved, jump on the email list, jump in the social media accounts, follow what's going on, listen to the conversation for a while, and then you'll start to see where could I help? You'll start to see questions come up, ideas come up, resources that people need. And you'll just be looking with a service heart of like, how can I give here? How can I help? So one is join the conversation. Number two is, and, and I alluded to this, consume the conversation, digest it, listen, hear. So get the book. Like I always say to people, like one of the best things you can do is get the Front Row Factor book, invest three hours to read it, and then determine from there, if this is a place that you want to play, because I took two years to figure out how to tell the best story that we could about who we, who we were, who we are and where we want to go in that book. There is no better way to learn about our charity, our mission, how to make a difference or how to live a front row life than that book. So you got to get that book. And then once you, once you consume, then you share like one of the best things to do is you share in the way that you can. So you might say, I'm a video editor, John, and I know, I know you got videos to do for all these recipients. I'd like to donate some of my time. Great. Hey, John, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. I see you post these pictures and stuff on social. I'd like to design some graphics for you. Awesome. Hey, John, I've got a t-shirt company. I see you do a t-shirt sale every year and you know I'd love to donate that way. Or, hey, John, I see you've got people that do fundraisers. They just simply go out and they do a, a marathon or an Ironman and they raise money for your charity. I'd like to do that. But whatever it is, you'll start to see it. And one of the greatest ways is to, to share whatever resource, whatever, whatever is working. So if you, if you hear a front row story on our social and you're like, that's impactful, share it. If you read the book and it's great, write a review and share it. If you listen to the podcast and you think it's great, share it with somebody. Passing along a message and recruiting other people is what creates that momentum for us. Uh, sharing the book allows us to find new recipients. It allows us to find new donors. It allows us to find everybody that makes this whole thing work. That's how to get involved. So Front Row Dads, every single thing that we offer, all the events, all the stuff, it's all at frontrowfactor.com. So if people want to go check it out and it feels like a good fit, great. And if it doesn't, hey, keep searching for the community that feels energetically like you're supposed to be part of it. And we'll have links to that up at juicegururadio.com. So you'll be able to find those links there too. Uh, John, I, have, I could probably talk to you for hours because I have so many more questions. I know where we've been past where we were going to go as it is. So I'm just going to wrap it up. I had so many more questions though, but we have to have you back because you're phenomenal. Um, the, uh, in closing, any other words of advice or wisdom that you can share? Anything that we didn't touch on that we can uh, wrap it all up? I mean, one thing I was going to ask you about was, the idea of living in the moment and how you're so in tune to our days. And you talked about that marbles analogy. And um, do you find that time slows down when we're more aware and making our moments more meaningful every day? Yeah. I think that the, the, how to be present, how to be in the moment, how to slow it down so that you can appreciate it and make an impact. I think it's, you've got to look at your day as, you know, first have some type of morning routine that sets you up. We talked about Hal and Hal's famous for the miracle morning. And it's six things you do in the morning. He calls it the savers. So it's silence, affirmation, visualization, exercise, reading, and scribing, which is journaling. And the idea is you do these six things in the morning. And when we teach people how to live a front row life, it's just sitting with intention to say, how will I be a moment maker today? How am I going to recognize the moments or create the moments? And to, to be thinking intentionally about your day. That's what you do in the morning. I always have morning questions that I sit with uh, on this couch right behind me, <laughs> right over there. And I sit on that couch and I do morning questions and I just let my brain process, right? What I'm going to create this day. Then throughout the day, your mission is to be present and in the moment. So you try to have reminders. I have things hung up all over my office. You see these signs behind me. I have things, I might wear a wristband. Uh, I have a front row tattoo on my arm, you know, to, 
to remind me to be a moment maker. The ideas are creating habits and systems and routines that keep us present. I have things that pop up on my computer that remind me to breathe and pause. I, I do it for my friends and then my friends end up doing it for me. We constantly, I did this last night at dinner. I paused and I said, hey guys, let's just take a moment and appreciate this. Because I wrote this in my book, by the way, before Macklemore just sang this and made it famous, was that one day these days will be the good old days. Um, so one day these days will be the, the good old days. And so the, the idea was that, you know, and as soon as I said it, they were like, ah, there you are, John. There you are, buddy. Like, that's it. Just having this mentality of being able to pause, walk up to somebody and say, hey, look, breathe. Look around, soak this in. Uh, do it at weddings, do it at, you know, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. It's just, let's take a moment and look around and appreciate what we have, appreciation. And then at the end of the day, how you wrap it up, there should be some type of journaling routine or celebration routine to look back on the day and recognize what worked. Sean Aker wrote about this in, in the happiness advantage, and there's great research around gratitude and appreciation. And we just look back and say, what front row moments can we celebrate? And, and how can we be appreciative of our day? And, and where did we fail and what did we learn from it? So that's how we remain present. We look with anticipation, we celebrate in the moments, and then we look back. That's what we, so that's full circle to where we started, right? Hope, celebration, and living in the moment. And that's just a simple way that you guys can do it now. So take that moment and set up a little time in the morning. Uh, set up a reminder from throughout your, for, for throughout your day, right? So as your day progresses, something that pops up to remind you or, or in your surroundings, shaping your environment, and then some type of routine in the evening. And that would be my, my, uh, my, my, inner, my, my invite to everybody listening. John from in the book again, The Front Row Factor. You find the website at frontrowfactor.com, and he's the founder of the Front Row Foundation, doing phenomenal, inspiring work, just really moving – John, thank you for being here, sharing your message, being in the moment, getting this out to thousands of people all over the world. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Thanks. It was awesome to be here. I appreciate you. Thank you, John. Till we meet again, brother. Absolutely. I'm Steve Prusak, and we'll see you next time. All right, we're going to close it out. Thank you again. I really appreciate you taking these moments to inspire all of us. So thank you, John. Oh, thanks, man. I hope that was uh, in service to your audience. I hope they enjoyed. For sure. Thank you for the great work. Take See care. Bye-bye.